joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm really glad to be here today because this has been a topic that has been um, on all of our faculty's minds. So we did um, lay this out in a teaching that we, or a course that we developed for faculty to do this summer if they're preparing to teach remotely in the fall. Um, but this actually applies to uh, courses in all modalities as I will cover. Um, so it's, it's applicable across the board. So in this webinar, uh, we are going to break down the idea of time on task and talk about what it is exactly, how we calculate it, what gets counted towards time on task, and how we should best apply it when planning our courses. Okay, so uh, let's start with the official definition from the New York State Education Department. Um, I am going to read this uh, slide verbatim. Um, but with a little bit of emphasis on key parts, and then we'll get to discussing those uh, points further. So time on task is the total learning time spent by a student in a college course, including instructional time, as well as time spent studying and completing course assignments, e.g. reading, research, writing, individual and group projects. So the first key point here is that time on task is always the total learning time. Um, for everything that a student does in relation to a course. So time on task is equal to total learning time. Uh, the total time on task for a course is always going to be the same, as I mentioned, uh, whether it's offered in a face-to-face -face environment, online, hybrid, combined, et cetera. Um, but where we start to see differences between the modalities is how this overall time on task is broken up. And this has to do with the second and third points in the statement, which are uh, instructional time, as well as time spent studying and completing the course assignments. So what counts as instructional time and what counts as time spent studying and completing course assignments is, the, is going to differ uh, depending on the modality that you're teaching in. And this will affect how tasks are distributed to meet the overall time on task. Now, this probably seems a bit abstract, but we how this works um, in a very detailed way uh, in just a bit and with some illustrations, which I hope will make everything more clear. All right, before we get into the details of time on task, you may be wondering, you know, why does this specifically matter? You know, I can figure out my course on my own. Um, well, the reasons are many, but the first one is a big one. So basically, making sure all courses meet time on task is important for maintaining accreditation. Um, courses that are under time on task likely do not have the rigor that's expected for the student to earn credit. Um, while students may sometimes like an easy course, um, when we don't have enough rigor, we're actually shortchanging them um, if we're creating courses that don't have them working up to that required time on task. Um, another reason is that knowing what time on task is for a course and thinking about your plan to meet time on task also helps you to build appropriate content and assignments. Um, if you're not planning for that, uh, you can actually have the reverse issue to not having enough rigor. Instead, we could end up creating a course that's super taxing and goes way beyond the proper time on task. Um, if you find this happening, you'll need to figure out where you can scale back while still meeting the overall objectives for the course. Um, sometimes while I'm working with faculty, they'll say, well, I don't have anywhere to scale back because I need to cover X, Y, and Z. Um, because those topics are a prereq to another course. Um, so I can't specifically give guidance to how to fix those types of larger programmatic issues, but it's at least good to figure out how far your course exceeds time on task, um, because maybe that's going to open up a channel to a discussion within your department or even um, a larger program. Um, another reason time on task is important is that planning for time on task also helps you to think realistically about everything that students need to do for a particular course. Um, this not only helps you to, to reach that appropriate rigor that we talked about, but also to spot gaps in your syllabus. Um, so maybe as you're looking over your allotment for all the tasks that you have in a course, you start to realize that there's minimal time for interaction, and maybe you can work to balance that, um, make, work to balance that out, uh, or maybe on the other hand, you realize you have too many tests and you wanna insert a project instead. So you can kind of work to see where there might be um, areas to balance the course a bit more. Um, finally, once you have a plan for all of your elements of time on task, 
it's going to help you set student expectations about what is required and when. Um, for example, maybe you're planning on front loading the beginning of the semester with more reading and lecture. Uh, so their time on task in those areas is going to be greater at first. You may ease up on those areas in the latter half of the semester um, as they start to work on a long term project. So it's good to be able to have this plan in advance and communicate it to your students so that they're prepared for what's coming and they understand your reasoning for the course design. So for all these reasons, it really is important to think about and plan for time on task. Um, one additional consideration is that when students switch modalities, especially when they switch them quickly and without um, much uh, time to, to think about it, such as they did this spring, um, they may feel that there's more work um, in an online hybrid or combined learning experience. Um, as we'll talk about, this actually shouldn't be the case if the instructor has planned their time on task appropriately, but um, these types of learning environments can feel sometimes like more um, work because there's more active learning. So knowing that you have planned properly for time on task will help you to set expectations for your students and then to communicate those expectations to them so that they know they're not being under or overworked. Um, so let me pause there before we get into some of the calculation stuff, just to make sure there's no questions so far. I think you're all set, Kate. Okay, great. Okay, so here are three things that you need to know in order to calculate time on task. And then in, on the next slides, we'll get to the actual calculations. So first you need to know that one semester credit is equal to 45 hours of learning. Um, next, in order to do the calculation, you'll need to know the credit worth of your class, um, i.e. is it a one credit class, a three credit, a four credit. And finally, you need to know the number of weeks for your class because that will make a huge difference in how the time on task is distributed. So once you know these three pieces of information, you can actually start doing the calculation. So here are two samples. And you'll notice that they have a different amount of credits as well as a different number of weeks. And that's really going to make a huge difference in the distribution of time on task that we see here. So taking the first sample, we have a three credit course that's being taught over a 15 week semester. So to calculate, we're going to take that 45 hours of learning and multiply that by the number of credits, which in this case is three. That's going to give us a total time of 135 hours of time on task. Now, remember, that's spread across your entire semester. So that's why we need to take those 135 hours and divide them by the number of weeks, which in this sample is a full 15 week semester. So that's going to give us nine hours of time on task per week. So this is your raw number of everything. And again, we're going to talk about how the modality is going to change um, the breakdown. Um, before we get to those types of breakdowns, though, I just want to give a second example. So in hey, can, we, can I interrupt you really quickly? There's a oh, question sure. here. Uh, okay. This is assuming all credit hours are lecture, not practicum or lab slash studio, correct? Um, yeah. So this is, uh, I mentioned earlier that I did a dry run with my faculty yesterday, and that was a question that came up with lab. So I, did, I was doing some research today and lab credits are calculated differently. Um, but when I was doing those calculations, the, the total time on task was still coming up the same, um, but it might get a little bit tricky depending on if you have two different faculty members um, for like a, a lecture section and a lab section. So the New York State, or actually no, the SUNY requirements for lab credit hours is um, about three credit hours per one three hours per week per one credit. Um, but that's assuming that they're not doing work outside of class, which this information is, is taking into account. So uh, if you're teaching a lab section, your hours in the lab should be um, the only hours that you're teaching, and you should not be assigning more work after that. Um, if you're working in conjunction with the lecture instructor, then maybe some of those extra hours can come out of the, the lecture section. So I was kind of wrestling with that earlier today. All right, and then we have a couple other questions, but I think you're going to cover these subsequently. I just want to uh, mention the one. Where is the one 
to 45 association come from? I'm trying to, one colon 45 association come from? That's the question there. Yeah, that's from the New York State Department of Education. Okay, great. Um, and that comes out of the idea of the, uh, the Carnegie unit, where you have, uh, for, you have one hour of um, seated time per credit plus two hours of work outside of, of class. And when you multiply that across a 15 week semester, you end up with those 45 hours. And then really quickly, um, for a three hour lab, is it reasonable to have students do work like write lab reports or study outside of the lab? Yeah, so again, that's sort of the question that I came up with and I know that's a common practice. Um, and again, if that either the lecture instructor is the same as the lab instructor and they're balancing out that in terms of the total time on task, I think that works out fine. But if you have um, an instructor who's teaching the lecture portion of it and then, you know, that's worth three credits and then they're assigning six at, uh, hours of time on task outside of class and you have a teacher who's doing the lab component for one credit where the students are meeting for three hours plus there's homework outside of class, then I think um, you're actually above time on task for that course. Okay, great. Thanks, Kate. Sure. Okay, so um, sample two is basically showing us um, a different breakdown and it's going to be really different from the first sample because of the fact of the six weeks uh, semester. So when you see numbers like this, either in the summer or even shorter times in the interim, um, that compression is going to result in a much higher time on task per week. So as you can see in the breakdown here, um, for a four credit course taught, taught over six weeks, you're gonna end up with 180 total time on task hours and you're gonna divide that by six weeks. So you're looking at 30 hours of time on task per week. So that's obviously a much higher workload for students um, taking a summer course. So another reason to really set their expectations of how much work that they need to do in order to um, accomplish the proper uh, time on task for a summer course. Okay, so once you've figured out the total learning time required in a particular course, you then need to determine what types of learning tasks will fit into your plan. Um, before we go through everything listed here, I do want to specifically look at the first task listed, uh, which is seated or synchronous learning time. Um, so if you have a class that's either fully face-to-face -face or a hybrid with reduced seat time or a remote synchronous course with required virtual meeting times, you do need to do one extra calculation to subtract um, the seated or synchronous time from your total learning time. So, for example, um, let's pretend we have a course with nine hours of time on task per week. Um, if you offer this course as a fully face-to-face -face course that meets for three hours a week, you then have six hours of additional learning time to fill with other tasks, and the distribution is going to look like this pie chart. Um, on the other hand, if the same course is offered as a hybrid and it meets for an hour and 30 minutes a week, then this means that you have seven hours and 30 minutes of additional learning time to fill, and you can see that there's a difference in that distribution. Um, in either case, whenever you have scenarios with either seated or synchronous time built in, that time is locked in, and that's always going to come off the top of your total time on task, even before anything else is planned. Um, Conversely, if we look at a fully online class, your total learning time is a lot more fluid and you have more freedom to determine the distribution of any applicable uh, tasks for that course. So uh, going back and taking a look at other time on task elements, um, let's see what we have here. So time on task is going to include things uh, like reading or watching lectures, and this is in addition to the seated or synchronous learning time, uh, reading other materials, watching other content, participating in discussions, doing research, writing papers, completing assignments or projects, and even studying. So again, this is a really broad list. Uh, they're more like categories than specific tasks, and it's definitely not exhaustive. Um, most faculty are going to have much more definitive types of tasks, and of course, not everyone is going to include all types of tasks in all of their courses. 
Um, additionally, the percentage that students engage in certain types of tasks is going to vary based on discipline. So let's take an example. Um, in a film course, the proportion of time spent watching content is going to be a lot higher than a literature course where the proportion of time spending, spent reading is going to be a lot higher. Um, in the same way, students in a lab or studio course are going to spend most of their time completing hands-on assignments or projects and possibly less time engaging in discussion. Um, now, all that makes perfect sense and the breakdown of task types should be driven by your discipline. Um, as well as by the objectives for a particular course. So even among your own courses, the breakdown might be very different. Um, but you don't want to ignore the balance um, totally. So for example, if you do have a course where you determine that 25% of the course is lecture and 75% is you know, projects, you might wanna think about injecting a few other categories of tasks into the course. For example, um, you know, could you add a peer critique component into a studio course where you might be including some uh, additional discussion? Or maybe could you assign a research project that provides a chance to explore the work of another artist? Um, this might not be appropriate all the time, but as you are figuring out your time on task, it's also a really great time to realign with your objectives for the course as a whole and to make sure that they are being fully met by the most appropriate set of tasks possible. So I thought I might've heard a question come in, so I wanna take a pause. There are a couple questions, Kate, um, but now I have to navigate back up <laughs> to the really good question. How do you figure out how much time students would take to, uh, to do a task or study for a test? I think this would vary greatly. Yes, and we, we definitely are gonna cover that. Um, so we're going to cover the concrete sort of stuff, and then we're going to get into those more subjective elements in just a little bit. Okay. I think it sounds like a couple of these other questions you're going to get to as well. Okay. Well, we can always uh, address them at the end. All right. So let's move on. Um, all right. So we have some more pie charts again, uh, but this time they're giving us a sample distribution of possible tasks. So in the first example, uh, we're seeing a seated course that has nine hours of time on task per week. So as we noted previously, we always have to subtract the seated time right away, and then we can distribute tasks for the remaining amount of time. So in this example, we have a very reading heavy course, and the rest of the time is distributed to a small amount of, of other content, just very generic, um, and a group project. So keep in mind, this may not be how every week in this course is distributed. This may be just a module. Um, and the proportions may definitely change from week to week as you are covering your topic. Um, so now let's look at what happens if we move the same course to a combined format. So at New Pulse, we've been calling uh, combines blended, um, which is a course we're, that we're defining as uh, having both remote synchronous elements and asynchronous elements. So in this case, we have a smaller proportion for the synchronous time compared to the seated example. And the online discussion replaces a group project that was part of the seated course example. However, we do see that the time spent on reading and on other content is exactly the same in both modalities. Um, but the biggest difference that we see here is that in the combined course, which is on the page, uh, the quiz and the lecture are separate tasks from the synchronous session. Um, whereas these elements don't exist independently um, at all on the chart for the seated course. So the reason for this is that um, these types of elements um, doing, you know, class discussion, doing quizzes is usually just folded into the seated section. And as I mentioned before, sometimes when a student takes um, an online or hybrid or combined learning course, they feel like it's more work. And that's because um, each of these different tasks is sort of discrete. So they're seeing a longer list of things, um, whereas they're used to some of those things being folded into the seated um, class time. So it's going to seem like more learning, even though as we can see here, it's more about the difference in distribution. Okay, so uh, this slide should hopefully uh, get into that question from before. Um, and I can never resist a Hitchhiker's Guide reference. So time is an illusion, lunchtime doubly so. Um, what I wanna emphasize here um, is that uh, 
basically, um, the biggest question around time on task is how to determine the student's um, actual time. And there are some different measures that you can uh, use to do this. Um, but we have seen that things like uh, synchronous and seated time is always locked. And some tasks that we assign to our students may actually have finite amount of times. But I do wanna address the fact that even those can be a little bit subjective um, and a little bit more fluid than they may seem at first. Um, so let's start to uh, figure out appropriate times. Um, one of the ways that we can sort of do that is to rule out how not to base time on task. So first, uh, you should not base estimates of how long it will take to do a task on your own ability to perform that task. Um, you are obviously good at the tasks that you assign or you wouldn't be teaching them. Um, it is therefore likely that you can go through any task at a greater speed uh, than a student. Um, some estimates actually say that uh, faculty can go through about three times faster than a typical student. Um, so you do wanna take that into consideration. Um, not only are you a subject matter expert, but most faculty fall into the category of professional student. So you're probably in academia because you're good at being an academic and things like reading, research, experiments, studies, and writing might come very easy to you, um, or they might be easy now because you have extensive practice. Um, so even things like reading, um, again, we need to use that maybe three times marker um, because uh, research does show that students just do not read um, as quickly as faculty. Uh, so something that a faculty member can go through in half an hour may take a student an hour or more. Um, so sort of on the same, uh, same idea, you don't wanna use your highest achieving students because they might have actually started developing some of the qualifications um, that faculty have in terms of reading, writing, research, um, and they may not speak to the, the rate that a typical student uh, could go through content. Um, but on the flip side, we don't want to use uh, struggling students as our milestone um, because you could end up slowing the pace dramatically for everybody else. So what do we do instead? Um, first, I would recommend developing a mental model of an aggregate student. And I do wanna be very careful here not to say an average student because there is really no such thing. Um, instead, picture a few uh, students who are the type to engage in the course um, but who are going to have a more diverse set of skills and barriers um, and create your aggregate student muse uh, from this collective group. Um, so this may be, uh, you know, the B, maybe even B plus students, um, but not the ones who are doing it because they're not putting in the time and they could be A students, but who are working to be the B or the B plus students. Um, so what can you assign to them that's going to be a challenge um, but is not going to overwhelm them. Okay. Um, I have a quick question for you. When you okay. use your, for, your formula for the 45 hours times three credits, where mm -hmm. are you getting that 45 hours from? Um, so again, that's the uh, coming from the New York State Department of Ed. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and that's being uh, based on the idea that you would spend uh, one hour in the class for a credit and then two hours outside of class, which is based on a, a what's called a Carnegie unit. And this also comes out of SUNY policy as well. Um, I could probably provide some some links for that at the at the end that I could throw in the chat. Great. Thanks, Kate. Okay. So the next thing that you should consider when you're trying to plan time on task is uh, considering the real time versus what you actually want students to do. So um, say you had a 23 minute long video that you want to assign. Um, while that may seem like a very concrete amount of time, um, if you really want the students to actually study that video and take careful notes, that 23 minutes is not going to be realistic. That's the, the real time uh, of the play time. And you're going to have to add on the extra time of maybe rewinding to study some part of that video um, and then to also have time to take notes. So that 23 minutes may look more like 45 minutes or an hour, 
Um, so even though it has, it's a task that has something with a finite time, you're going to have to build in that extra time to actually complete what you want the students to do. Um, same thing here with discussions. So in this case, you may want students to post a certain amount of times in, in a discussion and reply to others. But when you're thinking about time on task, remember that you're not just calculating the amount of time that a student is going to spend writing that post to accomplish that task, but also the amount of time that they'll take to read the posts of others. So if you're thinking that it might take students, you know, half an hour to write two posts, you also have to build in you know, another half an hour to an hour, depending on how active your students are in discussion, to count, uh, to count in the time that they're going to spend reading everything before they actually get to the posting. Um, and again, uh, if we take another example of this with quizzes, um, a quiz may be timed for 15 minutes, but if you expect the students to either review the quiz afterwards, or maybe you give them multiple opportunities to take the quiz, um, or even to write corrections for wrong answers, um, all of that has to be factored in to uh, the total time on task for that activity. So you'll be taking that 15 minutes and then depending on what else you want them to do with the quiz, you're going to have to build that out into that assignment. So this kind of leads to the last point, which is sort of a, a fall safe for time on task. So you need to build in a little bit of wiggle room. Uh, that's not really a technical term, um, but basically, even with the aggregate student model that you've developed, there may still be students who are slower to meet time on task requirements. Um, these may be students with a stated disability. Uh, it may be a student who just reads or writes a little slower than others. Um, it could also be a student who works full time or who has a very heavy course load in a given semester. Um, or maybe it could be something on your end where something comes up to, uh, to throw off the overall pacing of the course and you need to bump things back a little bit. Um, but whatever the reason, you don't want to schedule your course down to the last second because then you won't have any flexibility to adjust. Um, so yes, some of the higher achieving students may actually finish a little earlier um, when you build in this wiggle room. They won't actually work up to that 100% um, time on task. Um, but you will be providing a fairer playing field for everybody else. Um, and one more thing to remember here is that you might not get it right the first time, and actually you probably won't, um, but you can keep in, in touch with your students throughout the semester, or at the very least at the end of the semester. Um, if you do some surveys throughout the semester, and you're finding that they're taking a significant more time to complete activities compared to what you were estimating, you may be able to adjust some later semester assignments. So Hi, Kate. We lost your audio there for a little bit. Okay. Um, yeah, I stopped talking because I had some pop-ups pop up and block my screen. Um, so I was just saying that it is a good idea um, to keep in touch with your students and find out how accurate your times on tasks are. And even if you can't adjust in a given semester, you will be able to adjust in a future semester. And as long as you keep fine tuning, eventually you'll find a balance that's going to work for the majority of your students. Um, were there any other questions in the chat so far? Yeah, we have a couple of questions here. I'm gonna go through. First, we have one from Demetrius that says, would this apply for asynchronous video lectures? In the spring, I was able to fit more into a total one hour video time period than I would have been in a real one hour hours worth of class as there were no waiting for people to filter in or pre-discussion regarding other course issues or even questions during the lecture. Other students told me they would pause and rewind the videos as needed so they were spending more than the one hour on each video. Is there some rule of thumb? So I was looking for some specific guidance and there's really not. Um, the three methods that come up the most are um, estimating based on the faculty's own experience um, surveying students and then um, just experiential, you know, just keeping in touch and uh, adjusting the times on task in future semesters. Um, so my, my answer to his specific question with the lecture is, you know, it's great that you can, when you're doing a, a planned lecture with a recording, you can really narrow it down. 
but you know you don't want to close the door for those questions and uh, discussion that would have come up so that's when you start building out those tests into other things so you know you may only um, you might end up with an hour-long lecture uh, you might build in some extra time, maybe an hour and a half for the total time on task of watching that lecture in case students are rewinding and rewatching portions of it. But then you're going to want to add on things like discussion or maybe a, a Q&A forum um, to build back in those parts that are now missing from that interaction um, that you would have had in the classroom. So again, it's not that you're taking those out, um, it's that you're uh, distributing them a little bit differently. Okay, great. And then from Courtney, we have a question that says, any advice for building the aggregate student to estimate time on task from their perspective? How do we know how much a B or a B plus uh, student takes to do these items? Well, uh, the first time through, you can always start with um, more of the, they call it the faculty proxy guide, which is the um, what what time it would take for you to do something as the faculty person and then adding uh, three times to that. Um, and, you know, common sense falls in there too. Um, maybe three times seems, you know, excessive for certain tasks, but you can always err on that for the first time through a new course. Um, and then at the end of uh, that course, you can actually survey students and get their actual time spent on an item. And you can start, you know, take an average of that maybe, and then start adjusting time on task until you get to a point where um, students are estimating that they're taking the same amount of time that you're estimating they're taking. Um, so that's where that fine tuning comes in, and it may not be there the first time through. Um, when we have faculty who are designing an online or hybrid course for the first time, we sometimes tell them to just try out certain assignments in their seated course um, if they're teaching it you know, now while they're developing. And that way they can get feedback from their students um, in a format that they're more used to and then use those numbers to help them build their online or hybrid uh, asynchronous assignments. Great, and then Catherine shared a really great link for uh, calculating time on task. There's one a workload calculator and then that one that includes online activities and it looks really neat so Kate you're going to want to make sure you go back through the chat and see okay. those links but Wonderful. it's amazing okay yeah. great um, I'm just reading through just to see if there was anything else and Veronica is asking, I thought that three credit hours per week times 15 weeks equals 45 hours. Am I wrong? Um, say that again. I thought that three credit hours per week times 15 weeks equals 45 hours. Am I wrong? And then Stephanie just replied, that's class time. Right, so for time on task, it would be the three um, credit hours well, three hours over the 15 weeks um, would equal the, uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I think that's where you get that 45 from. Someone had asked earlier where you get the number 45 from, and I believe that's it. Yeah, so right, the three hours per week for the 15 weeks is the 45, but those three hours are per a single credit. So if you have a three credit course, that's where that multiplying the 45 times three. Gotcha. That makes sense. I hope that makes sense to everybody else. Any other questions before she proceeds? Okay, I think we're caught up in the chat. Okay. Okay, so um, here is, a, is one way to map out time on task. Um, and in this example, uh, the modality is a combined course again. So it has both synchronous and asynchronous elements. So we can see that the time on task has been noted next to some of the items here. Um, and at least one place, if you're looking towards the bottom of the uh, map, you'll see that one item has a range of 15 to 45 minutes. So, um, you know, that's very spread out. So some of the other instances, um, the time on task is a little bit padded already. So it's, it's sort of instantly building in that wiggle room. 
So it may not take um, a faculty member, say, three hours to read through three uh, short stories, um, but that wiggle room is sort of built in, assuming that it might take the students that long um, to do that reading. Um, same thing with that range that I pointed out at the bottom of the screen. Um, so in there, you know, if a student did well on the, the quiz, they're not going to have that many questions to correct. So again, your higher achieving students um, may only spend an additional couple of minutes doing a correction or two, um, whereas students who were struggling a little bit with that task may spend um, more on the, the higher end, maybe 45 minutes or so doing those corrections. So building in a range like that, again, takes into consideration uh, you know, more of that aggregate student who maybe does have some additional uh, barriers than your high achieving students. Um, but it's not going to substantially uh, disadvantage the higher achieving student by not having them work up to appropriate time on task. Kate, there are a couple people are want to see the um, the table you have there a little bit more clearly. It's it's really small on our screen. Is there a way that you can enlarge that? There you go. Perfect. Does that help everyone? Okay, that seemed to work for, for everybody. Um, no, someone, uh, Zana posted, I found listing times was very confusing and not helpful to students. Is this important? So this would be more for the, the faculty member in doing their planning. Um, I wouldn't recommend putting specific times into the syllabus or the course schedule or anything like that. This is just for the faculty member to make sure that they're on track for meeting that time on task. Okay, great. I think we're all caught up in the chat. Thank you. Okay, so hopefully I'm going to hit escape because I don't know how to stop sharing the Zoom. So hopefully that doesn't pull me out of the... Okay, good. Um, and so, let me just back up. So I do have, um, I did provide this sample uh, to uh, Victoria earlier today. Um, as well as a blank um, map if people wanted to try it out. So I don't know where those materials are going to be posted, um, but that should be available uh, somewhere on the remote teaching site at some point. Yep, they'll be posted on the RTI playlist uh, tab on that site. And then if you scroll down to this particular, the link to this video, below it there will be the presentation materials including those links. Thank you. Okay, so we talked a bit throughout different parts of this presentation about setting expectations for students. Um, so again, some students do feel like there's too much work in online or remote classes uh, specifically. And again, this is often because they're approaching those courses with their perspective of being a student in a face-to-face -face course, which is um, you know, what the majority of students are used to. So in some classes, um, as we know, it is possible that three or four hours of your time on task hours are spent in some sort of passive learning situation. So, you know, if you're sitting in the back of your class and you're not participating and you're not being made to participate, you may not really be associating those hours in class with um, actual tasks that you should be doing. Um, so if that's the case, then it really can come as a shock to the student that they're now expected to engage during all of these um, time on task hours. So explaining the idea of time on task, including how many hours of work each week are expected, should definitely be the first approach. Um, so again, I want to make that clear that that should be more about the overall amount of time they want to uh, spend on the course, um, as opposed to specific uh, time on a particular task. Um, next, it is a good idea to make it clear that most, if not all of these hours, are likely to be hands-on or active learning situations. So they're actually going to be doing something um, for all of those hours that you're, you're telling them. So if it's a three credit course over a full semester, you know, they're going to be doing things for nine hours per week for your course. Um, if we tie this into the third point though, um, it actually makes it a lot easier. So students are a lot more accepting of how much time on task they're going to be doing um, if they know why the work they're doing actually matters. So nobody likes to do busy work. 
Um, so you really want to make sure that what you're assigning has a purpose within not only the context of the class, but also um, life applications. So if you can start to make those connections um, and explain that they need to do X amount of hours uh, to meet the full rigor of the course, but those hours are going to be spent doing something very meaningful, then I think students are a lot more likely to view the time that they spend um, in a positive light. And then finally, um, as we start to talk to faculty about doing this type of learning, the first question we get is, well, this is going to be a lot more grading for me. Um, so that can be true, but there are some strategies for making it manageable. Um, so the first thing we recommend is to make use of self grading assignments. Um, typically, these should be for formative type of assignments um, as the students are learning the material. Um, this could be things like pre-assessments, um, so students can see what they already don't know about the topic. Um, it could be things like reading quizzes to make sure they're picking up on key ideas, um, or quizzes on the lecture materials to make sure that ideas from that material are being absorbed. Um, the next idea comes out of the School of Ed, and as we've worked with our education faculty, they've introduced, introduced us to the idea of entrance or exit tickets, which we found pretty cool. Um, these work best either before or after synchronous classes. Um, basically, the, egg, uh, the entrance ticket is a small assignment that serves two purposes. It makes sure that students did the preparatory work by asking them to comment on this material or summarize before uh, the synchronous class. Um, and then if everybody prepares in this way, the synchronous class will be more productive because everybody will have done the foundational work and put thought into the topic ahead of time. Um, the entrance ticket is sort of the opposite of that. It's a small assignment that usually happens after the synchronous class session, and it can be done asynchronously online. So the exit ticket might be something like posting about any lingering questions they have after the class session. And this is really nice because it ensures that the topic doesn't just drop when the session ends. Um, instead, they have an extra opportunity to make sure that they're clear on everything before potentially moving on to a new topic. Um, both the self-grading assignments and the entrance or exit tickets are usually graded very lightly. Um, with the entrance exit tickets, they may actually be just a complete incomplete. Um, sometimes they can also be folded into another grade. So for example, you may not collect the entrance tickets, but you'll know that students who have done them um, will have a much higher participation grade. So it sort of gets folded into another grade. Um, a third strategy is group work, and I know uh, some people find group work to be uh, more beneficial than others, but group work can be valuable for a lot of different reasons. So from a pedagogical standpoint, it does help students to work out issues uh, working with others, gives them coordination skills in planning uh, meetings and uh, signing work, and it can also help students to advocate for their ideas with their classmates. Um, so, first of all, you don't want to lose those elements from your online hybrid or remote course, so it's good to build them in. Um, but on the faculty side, it's really beneficial because it means reviewing maybe five or six group presentations or projects, um, to, you know, depending on your class size, of course, rather than, you know, 20 or 30 uh, individual projects or assignments. So, what this provides to the faculty member is the ability to give more detailed feedback on those projects and maybe even work with student groups um, during the formative stages of the presentation or project um, and really, you know, guide them through everything as opposed to trying to do that with 20 or 30 students, which is probably not possible. Um, but breaking it down this way gets you in touch with all the students um, in a small group setting, if not, you know, as opposed to an individual setting. Um, and then finally, a lot of faculty tend to get bogged down with the discussion board. Um, some even give it up because they feel like it's too much. Um, but the good news here is that discussion is largely supposed to be between the students. Um, the faculty member's role is more to encourage the discussion, but not necessarily to contribute to it um, in the same way. So, you know, we do remind faculty that it can actually damage a discussion if they drop down they drop into the discussion as the voice of God and give their opinion. <laughs> um, and the students may perceive that as sort of a, a stopping point where they're no longer supposed to debate the point any further um, or give their own opinion because the faculty member 
you know, sometimes seems like the last word on a subject. So instead of doing that and potentially um, extinguishing the conversation, faculty can do some of the following, which takes a lot less time, but actually can make it more productive. So you can obviously go in and ask follow up questions. So lots of faculty start with a question or a prompt. But as the discussion is going on, you can always jump in with additional questions. Um, you can serve as a devil's advocate. So, you know, uh, produce a different point of view and ask the students to argue um, for or against that view. You can ask the students themselves to take a different perspective on a topic and, um, you know, try to argue it uh, from a different light. You can always direct attention uh, to a quality, well thought out post from another student to serve as a model if students are not producing posts that are really beneficial to the discussion. Uh, you can ask students to back up their ideas with uh, supporting evidence from the text. And you can ask students to expand on ideas or to clarify. So the nice thing about all these strategies is that um, they don't take you that much time to type out. You're, you're really just jumping in and asking a question or um, you know, asking the students to bring in a little bit more. So that's not very time consuming, but when the students respond to those types of prompts, it can really um, enhance the discussion. So if the faculty member really wants to uh, jump in and do some summarizing of a discussion, that's a good idea to do at the end. So once the discussion is over, the faculty member can um, you know, highlight anything that was done really well in the discussion, and they can also fill in any remaining gaps in the topic that didn't get covered uh, through the student conversation. So um, overall, you know, having this type of discussion is going to save you some time because you're not posting lengthy responses throughout, but you can actually end up with a more productive discussion uh, overall. So uh, those are some strategies that faculty can use to um, meet these different types of active learning and to make sure that their course uh, is including enough tasks to meet that time on task um, without feeling totally overwhelmed by um, having to grade everything. So those are the, uh, the strategies that we have. And I think we, oh, we're almost at time. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm happy, I'll put my, email address in the chat. So if anyone has any additional questions, um, feel free to reach out to me and I'll be happy uh, to address anything further one on one. Okay, great. Can I just ask one quick question? And then um, I think people they've been uh, providing each other some feedback and, and suggestions here. But there was one, uh, because I'm not entirely familiar either with this, but where do we find or how do we set up entrance and exit tickets? This is a great concept and new to me. Yeah, so the um, this really comes out of our working with our literacy faculty um, in the School of Ed. They use them a lot. So it can be something as simple as, you know, a couple of advanced questions that ask the students to think about something that they read ahead of time. But the idea is basically that um, They'll have thought about the topic ahead of time. So when they come to class and the faculty member calls on them, you know, they're expected to already have something, you know, prepared ahead of time. So, um, you know, the entrance ticket can really be anything you want it to be. It could be a summary of something that they've read. It could be um, a set of questions. It could be asking them to prepare something. Um, so, you know, it can really run the gamut. And the same thing with the exit ticket. One, one thing that they do a lot is called the uh, stickiest issue, something to that effect. So, you know, just that lingering question that they might have. And it's also nice because if they submit it directly to the faculty member, it's a question that they might not have to address um, in front of other students. And that can be a nice way of um, letting them ask a question where they might feel embarrassed um, about asking in front of their peers. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Kate. That was, I learned a lot. I hope other people learned a lot as well. Um, we will, of course, have some time on task materials in the asynchronous materials portion of the Remote Teaching Institute. And, and um, 
please, you know, feel free to get enrolled in those materials so you can have access to those starting next week. And again, thank you, Kate, for joining us. The recording of this video will be made available on the RTI playlist, and we hope that uh, you'll access that if you want to go back through some more information, as well as the uh, Kate said she's provided a number of other links and resources that will be posted on that site as well. So thanks for. Oh, thanks so much for having me. Much. Okay, so in just a couple minutes, we're going to get started with the Blackboard Basics training uh, part two. So uh, if you if you want to continue on with the Blackboard training, please stick around. I'm going to just step away for a moment and then I'll be back and we'll get started. Thanks to everybody. Have a great day.